All right, let's jump into your questions. And as always, I'm going to call out your usernames so you know I'm talking directly to you. Today is Dr. Ergen Answers Friday. I want to see you every Friday on this channel to hear the answers to your questions. The first question comes from Donna Hickman, 57. 16. She's asking about eating Greek yogurt or cottage cheese with blueberries and walnuts for breakfast and whether mixing foods like zucchini, tomato, onions, and ground turkey together is okay. Well, the short answer to that is yes. That is actually a solid foundation. Greek yogurt or cottage cheese gives you protein. The berries give you polyphenols and fiber and the walnuts slow glucose absorption that combination is far better than cereal or toast the key thing i would watch is portion size and sugar content in that yogurt so stick to plain unsweetened yogurt and let the berries provide the sweetness as for mixing foods your digestion does not get confused by mixed meals that's a myth Actually, balanced meals with protein, fiber, and fat together improve the blood sugar stability instead of worsening it. All right, next question from Jongi the Wise, 7855, asking how many eggs are safe per day? For most people, one to three eggs per day is perfectly safe and often beneficial, especially if you are insulin resistant. Now, eggs do not raise blood sugar, right? They may raise cholesterol in some people, not everybody, but the cholesterol you are getting from the diet is only 15% of the total cholesterol. So 85% is made by your liver. So you need to address the fatty liver before worrying about the cholesterol content in the eggs. But what they do, they also improve satiety, right? And they are nutrient dense. And like I said, cholesterol fear around the eggs has largely been debunked for the majority of people. Now, if you have very high LDL, or advanced heart disease, well, that may be more personalized conversation with your cardiologist if you have to eliminate eggs or not. But for glucose control, eggs are not the enemy at all. Now, Techie Rock said that he mentioned that his A1C was 7, but fasting glucose was 90, even though he's on metformin and has zero carb diet. This is actually more common than people realize, right? So A1C reflects the average glucose over three months, not just fasting numbers. So you can have decent fasting glucose, but still have post-meal spikes, which will raise your A1C. Also, medications, right? Your red blood cell lifespan, we talked about this before, and metabolic variability can all affect your A1C. So two people with exact same numbers may have different A1Cs because of these variability. This is where the finger stick after meals or even a better tool, CGM, gives you much more useful information than fasting glucose alone. Now, some people say CGMs are not accurate. Well, that's not accurate. Because CGMs are accurate. They're just a little bit delayed. But if you compare most CGMs, I'm not saying every batch, but most of the time, the estimated A1C on the CGM will be very, very close to the A1C that is reported on the blood work. Now, moving on to Shedden 13K asking about grapefruit interacting with stroke medications well that's actually an important one grapefruit can interfere yes with certain medications especially statins calcium channel blockers like amlodipine and verapamil and some anti-clotting drugs by affecting the liver enzymes that metabolize medications. If you're on stroke-related meds, you should assume, yes, grapefruit is not safe unless your prescribing doctor explicitly says otherwise. That's not functional medicine, that is just pharmacology, okay? Now, next, Linda Kutzer, dash V2, asking how to get fiber without juicing? Great question, because juicing is not ideal for blood sugar at all. And the best fiber sources are whole foods, not the, not the blended ones. Vegetables, legumes if tolerated, chia seeds, flax seeds, berries. And guess what? Chewing matters. Whole fiber slows glucose absorption, right? But juicing removes that protective effect. So if digestion is an issue, cooked vegetables and soaked seeds are often better tolerated than the raw. Now next, 
Brenda J52 asked whether rice fiber changes after refrigeration or freezing. Well, good question. Yes, and this is real science. Cooling cooked rice increases the resistant starch, which slightly lowers its glycemic impact. It's not like a major effect, but it can help. Reheating does not fully reverse that effect either, so you can actually reheat it. This is magic? No. But it can modestly reduce your glucose spikes compared to freshly cooked rice. All right, next question from Charming Weniga, RD5177, asking about intermittent fasting and autophagy. Now, intermittent fasting can improve insulin sensitivity 100% and metabolic flexibility for a lot of people. And autophagy does increase with longer fasting periods, such as 18, 24 hours, sometimes up to two days. But it's not an on and off switch. You don't need extreme fasting to get the benefits, especially if you're a diabetic. And if you are on medications that can cause low blood sugar, like insulin and glucoside, you have to be very careful about intermittent fasting as well. And you have to have your doctor's support on that. Now, consistency, the protein intake, and resistance training matter just as much. Most people just do intermittent fasting and they wonder why it didn't work for them because they really did not pay attention to their diet. They did not pay attention to their exercise. Now, next question is cure fate illness or something like that. I asked if going 30 days without sugar is safe for diabetics. Well, it can be safe, but the context matters, right? So if no sugar means no ultra processed foods and no sweetened drinks, that's usually super beneficial. If it means extreme restriction leading to stress, sleep loss, or binge cycles like binge eating that can backfire. If you're on a lot of medications and you go on this super low carb diet, you may end up with severe low blood sugar because of those medications, so they have to be adjusted. But sustainable changes definitely beat short-term challenges every time. Next question, Andrea11240 asked how to eat beans without causing gas. Well, well, beans need preparation. Soaking, slow cooking, smaller portions, and pairing with digestive-friendly spices like cumin can make a big difference. And if you're not eating that often, start very slow. Ease into it. Now, gas is not a failure. It's just often your gut microbiome adjusting, saying that what's happening here? There's a lot of digestible fiber here. Now, Jim two times fifteen asked about eGFR, whether it's calculated from blood or urine. Good question. eGFR, it's a glomerular filtration rate, is calculated from serum creatinine, which is reported in your BMP or CMP, your age, your sex, and sometimes race. Urine tests measure protein loss, which is a different but complementary marker of kidney health and actually very important. Both matter, but they answer different questions. So I hope that answered your question. Next, Rabish Reshta 804. You asked if a fasting glucose of 100 after 48 hours of water fasting is concerning. Not necessarily. Well, during prolonged fasting, cortisol and glucagon rise and the liver releases glucose. That's a normal adaptation of response. One number without context does not diagnose anything. Next, DG King 2808 asked whether VIX Vaporob can raise blood pressure. Well, that's no, there's no strong evidence that topical VIX significantly raises blood pressure, but menthol can create a stimulating sensation. So if you are extremely sensitive or using large amounts, you know, just be cautious and monitor. Now, Shalom Marathon. You mentioned eating half a meal raises glucose no matter what, even after decades of insulin. Well, at that stage, insulin resistance and beta cell exhaustion play a role, right? This isn't about food quality alone. It's about insulin timing, dosing, your muscle mass, your liver sensitivity to insulin. This is where the individualized adjustment matters by, by your endocrinologist more than just some generic advice. Next is Rita Dallas 670. You ask whether anemia affects glucose averages. And yes, anemia can falsely elevate or lower A1C depending on the type, not so much the finger stick. And this is well documented. That's why glucose logs and CGM data actually sometimes more reliable 
than a Avon C alone. And finally, I have a few more questions. Jackstar1534 asked about mixing vinegar shots with water. Well, diluting vinegar is safer for teeth and digestion, right? But straight shots can irritate your esophagus. So yes, it helps with the blood sugar control, but you have to dilute it. Next, Jim Barrett questioned synthetic processes and asked about natural alternatives. Well, that is a valid concern, right? It's why quality sourcing and transparency matter more than buzzwords, especially in the supplement world. And Sloan 1971 asked why diabetes was diagnosed when random glucose seemed normal. Well, because diagnosis is based on patterns, A1C, fasting glucose, and glucose tolerance test, not just one random value. All right, I think we answered a lot of questions. That was a lot, but these are excellent questions, so keep it coming. Every Friday, we will answer these questions, right? And if this helped clarify things for you, hit the like button. It really helps this channel reach more people. And if you don't ask questions, I'm not going to do Dr. Egan answers anymore. So keep asking questions and keep coming back to watch it. And subscribe if you want clear answers without fear mongering or gimmicks. And keep dropping your questions. Like I said, I read them and we'll keep answering right here. We'll see you in the next video.